Good morning, everyone. We'll get started back here in chapter five this morning. So last time we were talking about what the signs mean for delta E, Q, and W. And we're generally thinking of the perspective from the reaction, you know, where you have some reaction or a system. Sometimes we think of a system or a reaction taking place. Now, reaction is always taking place among its surroundings. So you can sort of think about the difference between what the heat change of a reaction might be versus the heat change of something in contact with the reaction. And so we have an internal combustion engine um, where we have the combustion of hydrocarbons um, such as octane. So you can imagine that you, know, you have the burning of a hydrocarbon. And I think that information is meant to tell us a reaction where we know that the delta E has to be less than zero. We know that energy is coming off of this reaction. Um, this would be like our octane plus our O2 molecules up here and relative energy, uh, um, relative energy being higher than the products of CO2 and water. We could balance this out, but the sum of the CO2 and the water molecules um, energies would be lower than that of octane plus O2. That's where the energy is coming from, is this energy difference here. And now we know it's less than zero or negative when we have one of those reactions taking place where we can sort of predict that sign based on what we see in the reaction, like the reaction taking place with the flame or a combustion. Um, that combustion, that flame, is the energy being given off from that chemical reaction taking place. And so we know this is one of those exothermic reactions. We can't always look at the reaction and predict, but this is a type of reaction I think we can predict would proceed um, in an exothermic fashion. As we get to the end of the chapter, we'll talk about bond strengths and how we can sort of look at the relative bond strengths of the products here being stronger than those in the reactants. And that's where the energy difference is coming from um, in the reactants versus products. But we'll look at that towards the end of the chapter. And so then, what about the sign of Q and W? Well, we're told that um, this is occurring in the engine of a car that's accelerating. The reason why accelerating is helpful to know is that the car is being put into motion. So some force is being applied to the car to move it some distance. And so that means that the sign of W has to be less than zero or negative. Putting an object into motion means we're, we're, th that the sign of W is negative. It's the same sign as like heating up an object. Like we're heating up the engine block from the heat and the energy given off from the reaction. The reaction gives off energy. The energy goes into heating up the block. That Q sign is also going to be negative. And so I think this sign here to me always makes a little bit more sense in the W sign. Like if we take energy off the reaction and heat something else up, the uh, engine block's heat goes up because the heat was lost by the reaction. We'll talk in a minute about system versus surroundings, but if our heat of our reaction is dropping, then the heat of the surroundings of the reaction have to be increasing. So like, where does the heat go? It goes to the surroundings, it doesn't just disappear. And so the heat's being lost by the reaction, and then work is being lost by the reaction, being put into the car, put into its motion. So if you think about the car itself, its W would be positive, the engine block's Q would be positive, coming from the reactions, Q being negative and W being negative. Okay, so there's another example kind of about this that comes up next. So the answer to this question would have been A. Or let's get into the topic of gases and we'll come to another question kind of similar to the one we just looked at. And so let's think about um, like a piston perhaps. So we have an enclosed cylinder that has a movable piston and we have some initial state here. Let me just make this a little smaller. So we have an initial state and then we have some final state. Now the difference that's causing the change from the initial to the final isn't quite clear. Maybe there's a reaction taking place that's leading to um, uh, gas being created that's expanding the cylinder. Maybe we're just simply heating up the object we'll see in chapter 10, if you've ever seen like the, the gas laws in physics or chemistry, that if you change the, the um, temperature of a gas sample, if you increase it, you can increase the volume. So we have something going on here that's allowing the gas in our cylinder to expand. And then you can think about how the gas in this cylinder is working on the surroundings. It's physically moving the piston. It's putting that piston into motion. And by virtue of putting that piston into motion, the sign of W for this reaction, just being the expansion of the gas, is that W here is less than zero because we're putting work into moving that piston upward. 
there's an equation I wouldn't worry about committing to memory, but W is equal to minus P times the, the pressure times delta V. Sometimes this is called pressure volume work. And if we expand the volume, we go to an expanded volume, then we go to a more, you know, it takes a negative amount of work. So work has to be done in order to allow that expansion to take place. If we have the opposite reaction, if we have a contraction of that cylinder and the volume becomes smaller, then work would be positive. And work being positive, that would mean we have to maybe do work. Maybe we have to press down. So I might be doing the, the physical work of compressing that gas or something has to be going on in terms of the nature of the gas inside the cylinder. Maybe we're cooling it down. Maybe we're cooling the gas down. That's causing the contraction. Or maybe we have the consumption of a gas. Maybe we had gas that's being consumed in some sort of reaction um, that's leading to the um, uh, contraction. And so the, um, we can think here, this could be gas created by a reaction. And then the contraction could be the gas that is um, consumed by a reaction. So if we look at a reaction and it's, and it's generating a gas, if there's more gas on the product side, then we, we're going to be on the side here where we can expand the gas and that we can do work with that reaction, with that gas that's been created. And then if we're consuming gas, then we're on the opposite side where we can have a contraction of a cylinder and we could have work being done on the reaction by those surroundings. If you ask me, this is probably one of the trickier concepts in chapter five that usually, usually leads to one exam question that's usually kind of like the one we just looked at where it's just trying to pick out the proper sign for Q and W for a reaction. So you'll see some examples on the daily quizzes that kind of get at this topic. You'll probably see a, a question or two in the homework that relate to this topic. But I think to me, this is one of the more confusing topics in the chapter. Pretty soon today, we're gonna to wanna to get to like chemical systems. We're gonna eventually wanna talk about just, you know, mostly an open container. That's usually the type of reaction that you think of a chemical reaction taking place in. And in an open container, we're not putting objects into motion. When you think of most like chemistry reactions that we do like on a bench top, there's nothing being powered. So work is either very small or negligible or often zero in a chemical system. So we want to eventually kind of try to get work to a spot where it's relatively small. Where work is, is not negligible is like in a mechanical system. So how often in a chemistry class are you setting up a mechanical system? Not, not very often. So we talk probably a little bit more about work here than we should, um, but it's just really to introduce what it is and how it relates thermodynamically to some of our quantities. So, okay, so we have a balloon here um, filled with air. So you're just picturing some sort of a balloon filled with air, and it's warmed up, and through the warming up, the balloon expands. And so think about the sign of Q and W for the air inside the balloon. So imagine you're considering the O2 and N2 molecules inside the balloon. What's their sign of Q and W? So take a minute or two on this one and think if Q should be negative or positive, and if W should be negative or positive. So what do you guys think the sign of Q would be? Q to me, I think, is the easier one. Because the balloon's being warmed up, the air molecules are receiving the heat, their Q is increasing. So Q is going up, Q is positive. And then what about work? Are the air molecules working on the balloon or is the balloon working on the air molecules? And just think about what, like, to me, doing work makes sense, like, makes sense of the air molecules are working on the balloon, pushing it away. And that's negative. And that's the same as them like uh, a reaction heating something up. So if we're pushing heat into the surroundings, that's negative Q. If we're pushing work into the surroundings, that's negative work. So this is positive Q, negative work, because we're moving the balloon. If the balloon were to contract, that would be positive work. That would be the balloon working on those air molecules. Okay, so it's, we, 
I've mentioned system and surroundings a couple times. Let's talk a little bit more specifically about different types of um, systems that we can encounter. An open system is one at constant pressure. This is like literally just like a beaker um, that's open to the atmosphere. Um, and so the beaker can exchange matter with the surroundings and it can exchange heat with the surroundings. So we can exchange heat and matter with the surroundings. And the, the key is like if you create a gas, it just releases. It doesn't allow the container that it's taking place in to increase pressure. So we say at a constant pressure because if we create a gas or consume a gas, there's no pressure change. The, the beaker is always at atmospheric pressure or whatever the room and the pressure happens to be um, that that container is in. So the um, open system can exchange matter and heat. And this is the most like common chemical system. This is usually the one I'm thinking of when I think of a chemical system. I'd say it's the most common chemical system. So a closed system would be one where we just put a lid on that container. So if we put a lid on the container, then the container itself can no longer exchange matter. So there's no ma matter exchange, but there's still heat exchange. So we can exchange heat with the surroundings. Let's also try to make it clear that everything well, this is sometimes a little bit confusing, but the reaction occurring in the solution is the system. Sometimes we'll think of the solvent itself and the reaction as part of the surroundings. We'll see an example of that as we go along. But generally speaking, the solvent of that reaction is part of the surroundings as well. The actual chemical change, the substance is undergoing some sort of reaction or the system, and then everything else, even the beaker itself is part of the surroundings. Um, and so everything that's in contact with that beaker is part of the surroundings. If we think here, again, mostly the surroundings outside, although I think we can still think of the solvent being part of the solution. Let me try to give a quick analogy, and we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail as we go along. If you are dissolving something in water, we're going to do this in a minute with a couple of compounds to see the difference between a dissolution that produces heat and one that consumes heat and how those feel, and then how we relate the signs of you know, something like enthalpy or energy for those reactions. But if we, if we say for a reaction that's taking place in water and the reaction releases heat, do you think that water gets hotter or colder? If the reaction is going to release heat, where does it go? It's going to go first into the water, then it's going to go into the walls of the container, and then it's going to evolve to the surroundings. So if you're holding the container, your hand's going to get hot because the water is going to get hot and then everything else in contact with that surroundings is going to slowly increase in temperature. Okay, And so if we then think of the opposite, a reaction that's going to consume heat, where is it going to come from? Well, it's going to come from the water that's going to come from its surroundings. If we're holding the beaker and the reaction is consuming heat, it's going to start taking our heat. It's going to feel cold. So we can start to think if a reaction is taking place in water that produces heat, the temperature of the, the water, because it's the surroundings, should go up. And then the temperature of the surroundings in the opposite case where we're consuming heat should drop. So one important relationship is that the, the heat of the, the system of our reaction, or let's even write this, the Q system is often Q reaction. The book uses system a lot more than I would prefer. I would rather us think of the system usually being some sort of chemical reaction. So the system's kind of synonymous with the reaction, and that the heat change of a reaction is always going to be the negative of the heat change of the surroundings. Just meaning if the reaction gives heat off, it goes to the surroundings. And if a reaction consumes heat, it's coming from the surroundings. There's always this opposite relationship. So this is a key relationship that we'll use a lot in this chapter, and that we'll think about a lot. Okay, and so the, um, let's see if I can easily, I kind of want to erase this circle here because I don't want to confuse the, like I was just thinking of everything in contact with that beaker with no real limitation of space is part of the, the surroundings of that beaker. And just to compare that with the isolated system, an isolated system is where we take something like this container here that's enclosed, and then we put it into another system that's enclosed. And then this system here cannot heat exchange. It's maybe an insulated environment. 
So we create an insulated environment. I can even draw a terrible thermos or something to show. We're just putting a huge thermos around a reaction where the thermos itself cannot heat exchange, but um, everything inside here then becomes part of the surroundings of that reaction. And um, so the, the surroundings of the reaction can't exchange with its surroundings. So you have like a limitation how much heat there can be for that reaction or where the heat can go based on the, the confines of that container. So this is actually not that common of a system. I'm not quite sure why they talk about this one too much because we don't really deal with this one too much. We deal probably mostly with our open container, open system. And then when we talk about something called bomb calorimetry, it's using kind of a closed system that's in a water bath. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. But it's somewhat resembling an isolated system, but it's really best thought of as just being like a, a special closed system. That'll make sense more when we get to that topic. Probably, I'm guessing we'll talk about the calorimetry forms on Monday. OK, so open system, open container, exchanges heat and uh, matter with surroundings. Pressure can increase. The closed system, the key here is that pressure can increase. If we're creating a gas by the reaction, the pressure can go up in the container. So we're no longer at a constant pressure. The container confines the volume to be constant. So we do have a constant volume for our container. Um, and pressure can increase or decrease depending on the reaction taking place. And then the isolated system, kind of peculiar, not one that has a lot of um, utility or, or analogy. Okay, so let's get into like enthalpy. You may have seen delta age or have some, some recollection of this from uh, past courses. What enthalpy is and how it relates to, to energy is it's like the energy of a gas plus its pressure times volume is just the classic definition of enthalpy. And so then we can start thinking of, sorry, I want my, move this box. Oh, there we go. Okay. And so then work, um, as we saw earlier, was minus P times delta V. So just kind of recalling this equation here from earlier. So we're just recalling that equation. And then... Let's think of the, the delta H. So let's think of the, you know, we're imagining like an A goes to B, some sort of chemical reaction, let's say. And we're trying to think of the change of enthalpy where delta H would be equal to maybe the enthalpy of B minus the enthalpy of A, the final minus the initial states. And so our delta here, just a change, is just the final minus the initial. And so our delta H would be our delta, you know, E plus PV for the final, uh, you know, so E plus PV for the final minus the E plus PV for the initial state. And then so we can simplify our delta here as delta E plus P delta V um, if we're at constant pressure. So if we're in one of these open systems, which we mentioned is our typical container, so a typical container in an open container would be at a constant pressure. And so it allows our delta H to be delta E plus P times delta V. And so it just means that the pressure is not part of the delta. The only thing that can change would be um, the, the volume. OK, and so then let's keep trying to move this thing. This is the first time I've done this where I try to move this box out of the way, which is kind of silly. And so then. We had an equation earlier from Wednesday, we might recall, where delta E was Q plus W, where delta E, the change of energy for some system, is equal to the sum of the heat change for that system plus the W change. And the, we were talking a little bit about how, depending on how the reaction's carried out, we could have, imagining a reaction that gives off a lot of energy, that we could have a lot of heat formation, very little work done. We could imagine a, a really uh, efficient engine where a lot of work is done, very little heat's generated, or anything in between. And so we're just kind of recalling that delta E can be Q plus W. And so we can sub Q and W in here for delta E. So we'd have delta H is Q plus W. And then I think we can also then just sub in this equation here or think about how W is minus P times delta V. So let's do some subbing and see how this goes. Moving this box is easier when I was practicing this the other day. Here we go. Okay. So 
if so if we if we plug our q and w in for delta e then our delta h would be q plus w and then minus w here is the p delta v so w is minus p delta v and so plus p delta v would be minus w W is minus P delta V, negative W is P delta V. And so delta H is Q plus W minus W. And that little subscript P is just the mean at constant pressure in that open system. So in other words, delta H is equal to the heat change that accompanies the reaction at constant pressure in that open system. Now, Let's think about this for a minute. Like this derivation almost wasn't even needed. If you think, think about what it means to do work. To do work means you have to push an object and move it. How can an open system move anything if it's not enclosed? It really can't. So it's really kind of impossible to consider an open system that can actually do work on its surroundings. So if you don't have a closed container or a piston or something, there's no way that you can move an object through, um, through that type of reaction. And so I think this kind of makes sense. So what this is telling us is that enthalpy is the heat change and accompanies a reaction that's occurring in an open system. And so enthalpy, I think the sign H for heat is kind of synonymous. So a lot of times people call delta H the heat of a reaction. It's the heat change that accompanies a chemical reaction. Okay, so that in words is here. So the change in enthalpy of a reaction is the heat gained or lost at constant pressure. And the delta H is often called the heat of reaction. Okay, so let's look at a, a quick demo, and this demo is going to look at calcium chloride versus ammonium nitrate dissolving in water. And we can see here the dissolution reactions take place. They're both ionic compounds, and, so we, and they're both water-soluble ionic compounds from our solubility chart. And so we know calcium ion and chloride ion should form from calcium chloride. We see here that the enthalpy change for the reaction, the heat change of the reaction is minus 89.2 kilojoules. And so as the reaction proceeds, the reaction loses heat. So the reaction loses heat in this reaction here. It's exothermic. So reaction losing energy, losing heat, exothermic. And we can think a little bit about, do we expect that reaction to get hot or cold? Do we expect this to be a hot pack or a cold pack? And let's hold that thought and just contrast the opposite where we have the positive sign of delta H for ammonium nitrate dissolving to ammonium and nitrate ions. And here our reaction gains heat. It's endothermic. And so which one do you think is the, the cold pack? The calcium chloride or the ammonium nitrate?
So we've got a few paths that pass around the room just so that we can all. And, and this is kind of like if you ask, like, one of the most missed questions on the test is if I have a compound that dissolves in water and it dissolves in an exothermic reaction in, in a sense where it releases heat, does the, the, the temperature go up or down? This gets it wrong all the time. Um, that the exothermic reaction is going to release heat into the water, the water is going to increase in temperature, and then the endothermic reaction. Full packs and hot packs are just you know, use water to dissolve compounds that are either exothermic or endothermic to meet the need that you need a hot or cold pack. And another like important thing that we're seeing is that the, even though one's exothermic and the other's endothermic, both of these are soluble in water. It's another consequence too. Like you cannot look at the reactions and say. Oh, ammonium nitrate is positive, that won't actually react. And it does, it does dissolve in water. We put a lot of solid in, so it doesn't completely dissolve. But it has to be dissolving to lead to that heat change and that reaction taking place if you're cold patch on this side. Okay. So, sorry to stop you, but if, you, if anybody wants to come grab these and pass these around off the top, feel free. So, the, the few things that we're seeing are, again, the temperature of the surroundings. oppositely related. So the first example was in the exothermic reaction, the reaction's losing heat, the surroundings gaining the heat. Our hand, when we touch, that reaction is becoming hot because we're releasing the heat given off from the reaction. So exothermic reactions occurring in solution are going to heat the solution up. So again, the Q of the reaction opposite the sign of that of the surroundings. So if the reaction's losing heat, the surroundings gains the heat. That's lost. And then the opposite for the endothermic reaction the reaction's gaining heat from the surroundings, so the heat of the reaction increases, the heat of the surroundings decreases, temperature drops. And then finally, to reiterate, negative and positive reactions, the sign that delta H doesn't tell you if the reaction can take place or not. Both these compounds are water soluble. Both compounds dissolve in water. Now, solubility has a limit. They're not infinitely soluble in water. Um, but the sign of delta H isn't going to tell you if the reaction can or cannot take place. The, re the, the um, state function that would tell you if a reaction could or cannot take place is delta G, where you have delta H is minus T delta S. You may have seen this before. You may not have ever seen that before. But that's in chapter like 20 or 19 or something later in Chem 1220 that you'll come to that equation. So predicting if a reaction can take place or not is a different topic. This chapter is all about if a reaction occurs, what's the heat change that would accompany that reaction?
So another consequence is getting back into this topic of like a state function. So a state function is like our delta E or our delta H. We have a charged battery, we have a discharged battery. There's so much energy that can be given off here. So this difference here is equal to delta E. So there's only so much energy that can be given off by a battery when it's discharged. And then the question is, is that energy going to be all heat? Is it going to be all work? Or is it going to be some combination of the two? Could we actually have a case where the heat is down to here and then the W is the opposite sign to make up for it, which could be possible? So when you have delta E is Q plus W, Q and W can be almost anything depending on how you use the energy source. Um, but the sum of the Q and the W have to equal delta E. And then delta E is a constant for however much battery that we have available. Same thing with our reactions, that the delta H and these reactions are, you know, 89.2 kilojoules, and that's per mole of calcium chloride. So we have one mole of calcium chloride in the reaction, and then 25.7 kJs per mole of ammonium nitrate, because again, we have one mole of ammonium nitrate in that reaction. And so if we have, let's say, this reaction given off 89.2 kilojoules, and the container, which is most, like, technically sealed with a Ziploc bag, but it's not very sealed. Um, there's no gas being created or destroyed anyways, but this is kind of still an open system, if we think of it in that regard, that this system here has 89.2 kilojoules of heat to give off to the surroundings, and it's probably going to have zero work done. So it's probably not going to do any work on the surroundings, and it's just going to release all that amount as heat. So we have 89.2 kilojoules that come off of heat from that reaction, and then the other reaction is going to absorb 25.7 kilojoules of heat per mole of ammonium nitrate. Okay, so the idea of a state function is it's one that's path independent. A path independent function, we can go A to B, know that it's like here, 89, minus 89.2. If we flip the chemical reaction, we simply flip the sign. If we have a path dependent function, that becomes a little bit harder to predict. So Q and W um, are a little bit harder. If we flip reactions, we may not know if the sign of Q and W flip exactly, but the sum of them will. So delta E, delta H are our state functions. Okay. Let me let you guys think about this one here. We're adding HCl to water. HCl you can actually buy in a gas cylinder. So you can buy the gas, bubble it into water, and then it reacts with water, and then it leads to a temperature change. The temperature rises. Is this exothermic or endothermic, and what's the sign of delta H? So I'll give you like 30 seconds to think about this. said A, or you're thinking A, you're on the right track here. So what's going on with this reaction, HCl gas is going into water, and it's acting as the strong acid that it is, and it's dissociating in water to H plus AQ, and then Cl minus AQ. And then it's actually pretty soluble because of this, because of the strong acid nature of HCl. And so we have HCl dissolved in water, ionizes in the process, and then we're told the temperature of the solution rises. The temperature of the solution rising is indicating this, that this reaction is exothermic, that heat is being released, that heat released by the reaction goes into the solution to increase its temperature. And so while water, like, you know how we could write the reaction of water and write this as H3O plus instead of just H plus. We could write hydronium. So we could write HCl plus H2O goes to H3O plus. Now water, while it might participate in the dissolving of these ions, isn't really part of the net change. Like water is still water. It hasn't really chemically changed its bonding nature. Um, and if it has, it's like a small portion of it with one of the H, uh, H plus ions. If you think of how much water there is in a reaction compared to how many H plus ions, there's a lot more water than H plus ions. So water really isn't changing form here. It's not really part of the net change. It's really the surroundings of the reaction. So we have to think of the solvent here as surrounding that reaction. And it's re um, receiving the heat that was given off by the reaction. That's what we're seeing when we track a temperature. A really hard concept to grasp um, from, uh, from what I've learned over the years is it's really hard to c conceive of this idea here that a thermometer can't really touch a reaction. 
Because like a reaction isn't, isn't really a thing, right? It's just a reaction is what was there compared to what is there. And so it's pretty hard to be in contact with something that's not even there anymore versus something that is there. But what you can contact are the surroundings. So whenever you see a temperature being measured, it's almost always going to be the surroundings temperature, not the reactions temperature. So whenever we're telling you information about temperature, think of it as always being, being the surroundings temperature. Because that, we can touch the surroundings. We can touch what was there compared to what is there now because that water was there before and after the reaction. Okay, so let's think of this one here. We'll think of this one together. So a solution of gold chloride, AuCl3, absorbs hydrogen gas to form HCl and gold solid. Um, this is one of those redox reactions from chapter uh, four. So AuCl3 is gold three plus, and it can react with H2 gas to form, we're told here um, that it's going to form um, HCl and then AU solid. And so if we're going to balance this reaction, probably if I do a three here to get the three chlorides, then I would need to do a three halves here. So I'm going to need to double everything. So I end up with 2AuCl3 plus 3H2 goes to 6HCl plus 2Au solid if I wanted to write and balance this reaction, which I don't necessarily have to write and balance the reaction. This kind of relates back to something from chapter four. And then the three plus is going to zero and the zero H2 is going to plus. And so if we get a quick reminder of which atom is oxidized and which one was reduced, was gold oxidized or reduced? Gold gains electrons, so it's reduced. And then the H atom in the reaction is uh, losing electrons and is oxidized. And then just to, to, to remind ourselves of this, the AOCl3 would be called the oxidizing agent. because it's reduced to allow the oxidation of the other thing. So H2 here would be called the reducing agent. Just again, to get a reminder of those, those terms. So solution temperature increases when this reaction takes place. So again, that's going to be another Q negative, so the temperature of the surroundings increases, means the heat of the surroundings increases, meaning the heat of the reaction therefore had to decrease due to their inverse relationship. And then what about work? So work here is actually from the gas change. We have the AQHCl, so it's really H plus and Cl minus ions, and our H2 gas, we have a gas being consumed in this reaction. And so we have the loss of a gas, that's contraction. So contraction is that gas working on the gold chloride solution. So work is being done on that solution. So a contraction would be work positive for the reaction, and it would be the gas molecules working on that reaction. So the sign of W should be positive. But maybe the trickier problem here is figuring work out. Um, but work, if we're consuming gas, work is positive. If we're creating gas, we're pushing that gas into the surroundings. So if you think about the opposite, if we were to do the opposite reaction where we're creating gas, and that gas would be pressing into the uh, surroundings, and um, the sign of work would be a negative. I would prefer it to be in a closed container to work on the walls of the container as opposed to an open container where it gets a little bit blurry if it can really actually do work because where does it work on if it's in an open pressure system? But that's a minor detail. So, um, so we're just looking here at the loss of gas leading to contraction. Probably slightly better if this is in a constant volume container instead of a constant pressure container to really think about work in that environment coming from that contraction of gas. Okay, so let's get into 
um, some of the you know, main uses of enthalpies is trying to look at enthalpies of reaction and understand them for some different types of reactions. Um, and then look at manipulations of reactions to see what happens to delta H. And then also get into experiments where we determine delta H, like calorimetry experiments. And so here we see um, delta H is an extensive property. That means quantity dependent. So if you look at delta H, if you notice, there's no like per mole, it's just kilojoules, it's just a unit of energy. So water liquid to water gas is 44.0 kilojoules. We assume that for the reaction that the coefficients are moles. So they're assumed to be moles. So we have one mole of water liquid converting to one mole of water vapor. Again, we would imagine that liquid water has to be heated up on a stove. It has to absorb heat in order to boil. So the sign of, Q, of delta H being W makes sense to me. So the heat of this reaction being positive, an endothermic reaction I think should make sense. But then if we double the quantity of water, which is what we're doing with the two, uh, we now have two moles of water uh, liquid converting to two moles of water vapor that is going to have to double the magnitude of delta H. So if we change the coefficients, we have to adjust delta H accordingly. So we doubled the 44.0 um, delta H from when we just had one mole of each. Again, I have a box. It's just like not letting me... I this is a great idea, I'd like to put a box in, here we go. Move, okay, there we go. So, somehow I, okay, whatever. Um, so we have delta H, what happens if we flip the reaction? If we flip the chemical reaction into water gas going to water liquid, um, just like we would expect for anything with the state function, delta H is a path independent function, if we flip the sign uh, flip the reaction, we just flip the sign of delta H. So we just go to minus 44.0 kilojoules, and then we go to an exothermic reaction. So if we have a mole of water vapor, to convert it into a mole of liquid water would just release 44 kilojoules of energy. So we'd have a negative sign for delta H. And then we could, um, the delta H depends on the physical states of the reactants and products. So if we look at a reaction such as the methane combustion reaction, so CH4 plus 2O2 go to CO2 plus two liquid water molecules, we're told that the delta H there is minus 890 kilojoules. Now, I think we should be able to predict this as exothermic because of the nature of a combustion reaction being a reaction that releases energy. Um, and then what if we wanna convert or have the reaction where water is formed as a gas instead? What if we carry the reaction out in a different way where water is formed as water vapor instead of gaseous water? Well, we saw earlier that two liquid waters to two gaseous water molecules has a delta H of 88. If we imagine, and this works because of the, um, due to the state function nature of the delta H function that our water liquid here is just canceling itself out. And so if we sum these reactions up, cancel out the two liquid waters on both sides of the reaction, we now have CH4 plus 2O2 goes to CO2 plus two water vapors. I just then take the minus 890 kilojoules and add the 88.0 kilojoules. We'll see this later as Hess's law, but Hess's law is really just a consequence of the first law of thermodynamics and what it means to be a path independent function. So if we can add the reactions up, we just add up their delta H's. So minus 890 plus 88 would be minus 802 kilojoules. So we can manipulate reactions and add them up together and apply things like Hess's law to figure out delta H's of reactions from other delta H's. So let's calculate the heat released or absorbed when five grams of hydrogen peroxide decomposes at constant pressure according to the reaction below. Now, this word here at constant pressure, like I put it here because delta H is the state function for the reaction occurring at constant pressure 
technically isn't exactly the heat change if it were at constant volume, but you'll probably not see this stated in most problems. We're going to assume that most reactions, unless otherwise stated, are in an open container. And even if they're in a closed container, we're gonna see soon that it's a negligible difference anyways. So even if this is in a non-constant pressure container, even if we do seal this container up, it's negligible anyways in terms of the difference that that would have in terms of the heat versus the sine of delta H. So we have a exothermic reaction taking place, heat's being given off, right? And so how much heat's given off, so we, we can see heat's being released here just from the nature of this being an exothermic <laughs> reaction. How much heat is released when five grams of H2O2 decomposes? If we had two moles of H2O2 decomposing, we'd have minus 196 kilojoules given off. So, so this answer here can't be right, because that would be the heat given off if we had five, uh, had two whole moles of H2O2 decomposing. We only have five grams. So if we calculate our Q reaction, the heat released by the chemical reaction taking place in this problem, we have five grams of H2O2. The molar mass would be 32 plus 2.016, so it's about 34.02 grams per mole of H2O2. And I just go to moles because that's my relationship with my reaction. For every two moles of H2O2, according to this reaction, the Q reaction is minus 196. We go 5 divided by 34.02, divide by 2 times minus 196. But this is the most important number, I think, in the problem, is the minus 196 kilojoules is the ratio for two moles of H2O2 reacting. So we have to get that relationship, that we have to look at the reaction, look at the coefficients in the reaction. Those coefficients are moles. And so we have to use that number of moles of H2O2 in our conversion here. So we go grams of H2O2 to moles, moles to kJs. And so now when I get minus 14.4 kJs, I can come back to the heat being given off by this reaction, that the Q reaction is negative. The reaction's losing 14.4 kilojoules of energy. The surroundings are gaining 14.4 kilojoules of energy. So 14.4 kilojoules is released by this reaction. Now, I like to think of like heat release, heat gain, kind of like money in a way. Like if um, a, a lot of problems, I like to word them in a way that the answer is almost always positive. Because if I said, you know, you went to the casino or something, uh, you, you went on these sports gambling sites and bet on football games or whatever, I wouldn't ask you, what's your money change for the weekend? That would be a weird way of asking it, right? Like, what's your, your net change of money through the, the, the weekend sporting events? And you said negative 20. That'd be a weird way of, of asking the question. I think heat's kind of the same way. We like to ask, how much money did you win? How much money did you lose? How much heat did you give off? How much heat did you absorb? Where the heat itself is almost always positive, and we're just trying to think of absorbed versus given off in terms of the energy landscape. So same thing with like win money versus lose money. We tend to think of the, the sign of money as usually being positive, and then just the sign being either gained or lost. Same thing with heat. Now, calorimetry is going to be our main way that we determine or study like what these delta H's are for some different types of chemical reactions. And so we're going to start, though, with um, some specific heats of different substances, because we're going to see that generally calorimetry is taking place in a solvent where we're tracking the solvent's heat change uh, through the course of a reaction and from which we can gather how much heat was gained or lost by that chemical reaction. So we see some different substances here that have characteristic um, um, specific heats. So the specific heat is, speci you know, what it means is how much heat it takes to raise one gram by one Kelvin or one degree C. Okay, so the, the heat it takes to raise one gram of an object by one degree C, where one degree C of increase in temperature is one Kelvin. Like this is a weird, like we've actually, I mentioned this before, that for a change in temperature, it's one degree C is one Kelvin. Like think of the delta here. If you're going from 25 to 26 degrees C, 
that that would equal going from 298 to 299 Kelvin, and both those deltas would be one degree C, first one Kelvin. So the specific heat's relating how much heat it takes one gram of substance to increase its temperature by one degree C or one Kelvin. And degree C and Kelvin in a delta are interchangeable. We'll see examples of that, but it's something to kind of start thinking about and to reinforce. I've seen a lot of cases where students like will convert the Kelvin here and multiply the specific heat by 273.15 or something or try to convert it to, to Celsius to Kelvin. We don't need to do any conversions between Celsius and Kelvin with the delta T. They're synonymous with each other. And so we see N2 specific heats 1.04 joules per gram Kelvin. So it takes 1.04 joules to raise one gram of gaseous N2 um, uh, to raise its temperature by one Kelvin or one degree C. We see that most metals are relatively low. Um, so um, less than one joule per gram per Kelvin where water liquid is about 4.18. So if we have an equal mass of iron versus water, it takes about eight to 10 times as much heat to raise water's temperature by the same amount of degrees as iron's temperature. So a cast iron skillet on the stove heats up a lot faster as a result than the pot of water because the water has to absorb more heat, takes more time for that to take place. And you're also just seeing that the, the CS is a characteristic property, that every substance, even in different uh, phases, they're, um, if we looked at the different phases of water, like solid versus gaseous water, have different um, specific heats as well. So specific heat is phase dependent, and it's a characteristic property of a substance. Okay. So if we imagine we can do a problem like this where we put 10 grams of iron into water at 100 degrees C, or, or uh, 100 grams of water at 25 degrees C in an isolated system. Now here we're being told isolated system just so we can imagine all the heat from the iron goes into the water and none of that heat's being lost to the surroundings in the meantime. So oftentimes in these problems we're being told we have an isolated system just to simplify the problem. Um, or you do it in a thermos just so that um, you have minimal heat exchange with the surroundings. And so doing like a heat, Something like in a thermos is gonna be easier so that the heat changes are just occurring within the cup and you don't have any additional changes of heat taking place. So 10 grams of hot iron placed into relatively cold water. What is the final temperature of the water and iron once they thermally equilibrate? You, we can use the specific heats on the previous page. Well, this is kind of like a heat of the system versus heat of the surroundings type problem where the heat of the iron versus the heat of the water are going to have an opposite relationship. So think about iron's gonna lose heat and then water's gonna gain the heat that's lost. So water's temperature is gonna go up, iron's temperature is going to go down, and they're going to thermally equilibrate. They're gonna end at the same temperature. Now, I can put the, this negative sign anywhere. And in fact, sometimes there's a confusion on a confusion that I'm saying the Q of water has to be negative when I put the negative sign there. I'm just saying the sign of water's heat change is the opposite sign of iron's with that minus sign. So I can put this minus sign on either. I can put it over here or I can put it in front of water. It doesn't make much of a difference. And so the heat of iron would be minus, if I keep the minus sign here, minus the MCS delta T of iron And that's gonna equal the MCS delta T for water. And let me just throw in the mass of iron for the iron part of the problem and mass of water for the water part of the problem. And then the specific heat of iron and the specific heat of water to their respective sides of the equation. And so I have a little bit of an object that has a pretty low specific heat and I have a lot of an object with a pretty high specific heat. Which, like, <laughs> there's some alarm going off. Like this temperature here seems out of reach, right? It, like if we're thinking we're gonna probably negligibly increase the temperature of water just due to the differences of mass and the differences in specific heat. Um, if you guys wanna try to solve this problem, you're welcome, but we'll pick up with the solution of this problem just doing the algebra um, in class on Friday. Or wait, today's Friday, on Monday, <laughs> say Friday. All right, guys, have a great weekend. It's a bye week.
get some work done. <laughs> Have a great weekend.